Hello and welcome to the FUBIS FUBEST online lecture series for 2021. My name is Lauren van Vieren and today I'm going to be delivering a lecture entitled The Haunted City, Reimaginings of Berlin in the 20th Century. And this is a topic that's very much, um, to, it's very close to my heart. It's something that's fascinated me since I relocated to the city permanently in 2014 from South Africa. And this is the sense of emptiness that people so often comment on when they encounter Berlin for the first time, and which I certainly experienced in the early period of my time here. Now, even under the frankly disfiguring a reconstruction of the city that's going on right now, massive redevelopment, massive gentrification, mostly at the hands of international developers, um, even with this, dram these dramatic changes, the city is still, there still is something different about Berlin. There's a feeling here that people notice and pick up on. And I personally have been asked by many, many uh, tourists, why is Berlin so empty and quiet? Now, the obvious answer, the very practical answer to that question would be that Berlin, unlike a city like Barcelona or London, um, is not centralized. In other words, the city is very much um, a decentralized city and people keep to their neighborhoods and all the neighborhoods have their own centers. So there's less traffic, there's less throng at the heart of Berlin than in other major European capitals. So that's the practical answer. And yet it very seldom entirely satisfies people when I say this. And it's odd because at, uh, at surface level, Berlin has what all cities have. Streets, you know, buildings, traffic. Uh, tourists, parks, you know, all the things that are in a city. So what is it about Berlin and what do people mean when they say there's something quiet about the city? There's something empty about the city? Uh, and I'm going to try and answer that question in this lecture. Uh, and the answer is not entirely to be fashioned out of the bricks and mortar of fact um, and statistics. Um, I'm going to be reaching into the stories of the city to try and answer the question. Um, and essentially the story begins and ends with the following notion that Berlin, to a unique and extraordinary degree, was the site of such catastrophe in the 20th century that in its rebuilding, building, rebuilding after World War II, um, it became a kind of palimpsest the literal landscape of the city became a kind of palimpsest of all the warring and successive ideological configurations and incarnations that parts of the city um, became or embodied. Um, and this has scarred and defined the city right up to and way beyond the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is why, as I say to you, even now we have a situation where despite the huge redevelopment, there is that lingering emptiness. So in order to set about telling these stories, we're going to look at sort of three themes. The first, I'm going to talk about the way in which Berlin was rebuilt, reconstructed, and of course divided, rebuilt and reconstructed after World War II. Um, and then I'm going to consider the effect of the Berlin Wall on the city, not just as what is, it is so often regarded as in the English-speaking world, the Anglophone world sees the wall as this symbol of the Cold War. Um, of course, for Germans living cheek by jowl with the wall, it wasn't a symbol, it was a daily reality. But I'm going to be looking beyond the story of the people and the division of, sit, of the city and the division of families and all the trauma that that caused. And I'm going to look at what the wall did to the city itself. And it is fascinating because it was something, the Berlin Wall was something that fundamentally altered and damaged and of course defined the landscape of Berlin in surprising ways. And that's why the next thing we'll look at is two of the most important memorials developed in the post-wall post-wall era, the topography of terror and the Holocaust Memorial. And we're going to be looking at the way in which 
these and memorials like them actually incorporated the emptiness left behind by the Berlin Wall into their meaning, into their physical structure. And finally, I'm going to conclude by talking about other ways in which that lingering emptiness marks the traumatic history in the city. And I'm going to end optimistically and say that in a sense, by preserving that emptiness, this city has done extraordinary things in honestly and powerfully addressing the horrors of the Nazi era and the traumas of the division of Germany that followed. begin uh, with a quote and a comment that Brian Ladd raises in his wonderful book, The Ghosts of Berlin. In his conclusion to a book devoted to a discussion of how Berlin has been the site of relentless confrontation with the German past, past in the construction and reconstruction of its urban landscape, Ladd writes, and I quote, all cities' buildings display their cultural traditions but the sandy soil of the German capital conceals the traces of a history so fiercely contested that no site, however vacant, listen to that, no site, however vacant, is safe from controversy. And really, this quote is perfect for the lecture, and it'll kind of bookend it. Brian Ladd also interestingly describes the story of how Berlin became the capital of United Germany, reunited Germany, in 1990, and what's incredible about this story is that nothing about that process was inevitable. In 1949, the two Germanys come into being. Berlin is permanently divided. And the capital of West Germany moves to Bonn, a small city on the Rhine. And the lawmakers at the time, the West German lawmakers, make a promise that in time they will return to Berlin and Berlin will once again be the capital of a united Germany. But keeping that promise was way harder than people could have predicted in 1949 because by 1990, after the Berlin Wall had fallen, there were two Germanys now, two very different places with very different kinds of people living in them who'd grown up in very different societies. And Berlin, East and West were also very different places. And this difference led to a very fraught process and a very intense debate about what the right thing to do would be and many West Germans argued that there was no point in relocating this, the capital back into Berlin, especially since Berlin now suddenly started to stand for the very worst excesses and traumas of the recent German past, including, for example, and obviously the Nazi regime, and then the division and the Berlin Wall. Uh, so there was a sense of resistance to Berlin becoming the capital again. And eventually the argument was reasonably made that the Ber Berlin needed to be the capital because it would then represent both Germanys in the new government. And this seems a very sensible decision. But it was by no means a foregone conclusion. And the statistics are 338 votes in Parliament on the 20th of June 1990. 338 people voted in favour of Berlin becoming the capital again and 320 were opposed. That is how narrow the margin was. That is how much Berlin had become a kind of controversial fault line in the psyche of the reunited Germany. The point of telling this story about the controversy around Berlin becoming the capital again is to illustrate the way in which the past haunts the present, as Brian Ladd says in that quote, in this city. And the new bosses, when they came to Berlin in the 1990s, the challenge they faced in trying to manage the residual layers of the past in the street, on the streets and squares of this city, a traumatic and catastrophic past, the Nazi era, the era of the division, that still lingered physically here in the city. And in order to understand the challenge faced by the new German government in the 1990s, we have to go back to the end of World War II and look at the very interesting story of how the city was reimagined and rebuilt um, in, the, in the devastation left behind by World War II.
Now if we look at the reconstruction of Berlin after World War II, it's very important to recognize in that immediate period after the war ended, between 1945 and 1949, the people involved in conceptualizing the rebuilding of Berlin did not, could not have known that what would ensue would be permanent division of the city and eventually the Berlin Wall being built in 1961. So initially, in the aftermath of the war, um, the earliest town planners and architects, who were in fact rallied under the auspices of the Soviet occupiers, were interested in rebuilding the city as a whole. And not only that, but their purpose, their fundamental uh, impetus was to eradicate the traces of the Nazi past. This was the initial idea. So straight after the war ends, the city is occupied by the four occupying powers of the British, French, American and Soviets, the victors of World War II. And the important thing to note here is that for the first two months, the sole occupiers of Berlin were the Soviets. Um, and that um, division of the city was never intended to be a permanent solution. The idea was never that there would always be an East and a West Berlin. The Soviets used their two months of sole occupation of the city to Sovietize the city and to essentially annex the most important central parts of the city, uh, which endured beyond 1949 because East Berlin, and this is a very important point, contained all of the important historical heartlands of the city within its, uh, its confines. So the original, the initial um, idea behind the reconstruction is to reconstruct the entire city. Then in 1949, the two Germanys come into being, East and, Berlin, East and West Berlin now become separate cities, essentially. West Berlin consists of the amalgamated um, American, British and French occupied zones. Uh, East Berlin is the old Soviet occupied zone. And when this division becomes permanent, the town planners and architects now busy with the reconstruction of the city face the existential crisis that one city has become two. Now, a really important point about this um, immediate post-war reconstruction project, or the ideas behind it, was that the architects and town planners saw um, Berlin as a kind of tabula rasa, as an empty space, um, as a year zero that could be rebuilt from scratch. And this was pure idealism. Berlin was not like cities like Warsaw um, that were entirely destroyed by the war. Berlin still had bits and pieces of itself really fundamentally still in place. The inner city, had been damaged or destroyed. 60 to 80% of the buildings had been damaged or destroyed, but there was enough remaining that any idea that the Nazi legacy could just be eviscerated and had been evaporated, and that this was a chance to start from scratch, was essentially idealism um, and was simply not the reality. In 1949, the two Germanys come into being, uh, East and West Germany, and Berlin is permanently divided. The former um, allied occupied zones of Britain, France and America are merged into West Berlin and the Soviet sector becomes East Berlin. And now what happens is that Berlin becomes what Alexander Ritchie, um, um, as Alexander Ritchie, the historian of Berlin, describes a hostage to international politics. In other words, the very landscape of the city becomes the site of the Cold War as both sides of the city create ideological versions of what they think a city should look like. And this is the legacy and destiny of Berlin, divided after 1949. Right, let's turn attention to West Berlin after World War II. With the final division of Berlin into East and West Berlin in 1949, architects and town planners on the western side of the city uh, recognize that they now can no longer naively hope uh, to rebuild the whole city as one, but have to focus on the western half 
And the decision is made to, uh, to turn West Berlin into a kind of showcase of Western capitalism. To make it a shopping destination, lots of color, light, technologically advanced, a car city. So tram tracks are ripped up, roads are widened, automobile city. Um, the model for this showcase of Western capitalism is of course America and American cities. So this is a very conscious reworking of the city's landscape uh, for ideological purposes. The old um, glamour strip along and shopping district of the Kurfürstendamm, uh, which used to be the heart of Charlottenburg, is now reconstituted as the heart of the whole of West Berlin. And a lot of these physical changes, the widened roads, etc., occur along the main stretches of this part of the city. Um, the result is an Americanized, an, um, an Americanized city with an emphasis on um, automobile traffic. And you can see that today still. As a cyclist, if you go down to West Berlin, you know you're in the Old West when you're suddenly in areas where the roads are way wider than they would be in the Old East. There was also at the same time the same naive desire on the part of architects working with this. A, to use West Berlin as a, an experiment in the potential for a completely new and modern city built on the wreckage of a difficult past. And in this, architects like Hans Scharoun um, had extreme visions of a kind of glass and metal metropolis rising up on the Brandenburg Plains none of which came to being as many people have many uh, writers have said thank heavens uh, some of the ideas were so preposterous it would have entirely disfigured berlin but a fair amount of the architecture that came up around this time especially in the 1960s are by today's standards fairly ugly and unattractive and mismatched because here's the point these modern incarn this modern incarnation of west berlin very consciously created, could not eradicate the old Berlin. As I've said, this was a, na a naive notion. And in the end, the town planners, the architects, and the people involved in creating the post-war uh, West Berlin were confronted still with the stubborn remains of the Nazi regime on the physical landscape of the city. And now added to that were involved in this existential crisis whereby one city has suddenly become two. So what was happening in East Berlin, whilst West Berlin was being reconstructed as the showcase of capitalism, the answer is something very, very different. Um, one of the first major projects undertaken uh, by the East Germans was the building of Stalin Ali, which later became known as Karl Marx Ali. And in this, they embodied their criticism of the rebuilding of West Berlin as very modern, as disconnected from the city's past, as Americanized, a sign of kind of decadence. Whereas what they said was that their uh, this great socialist boulevard that they were designing was linked to the German past, to Berlin's past, um, linked back to the building of the Unter den Linden, the main avenue of the kings in central Berlin, uh, linked back to the neoclassical buildings designed by Schinkel, um, a beloved architect of, of Berlin, and of course bypassing the Nazi era completely. Um, so there was a very clear idea behind the way East Berlin would look, and this was certainly also influenced by Moscow. So the eyes of the architects and town planners of East Berlin was, were essentially on the East, on the Soviet Union, on Moscow. Most of the uh, town planners and most of the architects who were redesigning East Berlin had trained in Moscow or attended conferences in Moscow. So the way in which they envisaged this new Grand Socialist Boulevard was a wide double lane road uh, that could um, serve as the stage for all the pageant, the military pageantry of life in East Berlin. So big enough for an army of 20,000 marching men, 10 abreast, tanks, guns, all of these things, part of this sort of um, military pageantry. Um, and then everything about the street was big. There was lots of space, vast grass verges very, very high lamps, um, street lamps. And then these great big block-like um, 
apartment blocks with elegant, intricate facades, uh, bearing a promise that in the land of living socialism, people could live, ordinary people could live in palaces in a way. I and mean, that was the degree to which there was that promise, essentially. And ultimately, the idea was that the space of Karl Marx Ali dwarfed the individual, um, atomized the individual, emphasized the collective which is why it was deeply criticized by Western architects who said that it was a vulgar and aggressive piece of architecture. Um, interestingly enough, if you go there today without any knowledge of the past, and if you don't know about Eastern Europe, as a humble South African who had not any sense of the aesthetic of Eastern Europe, when I arrived in Berlin in 2014, I was completely puzzled by Karl Marx Ali until I learned its history. Because when I came there on the back of a motorbike um, in the summer of 2014, all I thought was, this is a place unlike any I've ever seen before. And what stayed with me was these somber great blocks of flats, vast unused space, and a kind of lingering emptiness that fascinated me and asked me to, and forced me to question the origins of the strange place. And I'm going to give you a taste of that now, um, a short sequence cycling through, along Karl Marx Ali as it looks today, um, to give you a sense of what I mean about the uncanny emptiness of the place and also um, its uh, very special form that evokes an ideological moment that has gone. to make about Star uh, Karl Marx Ali is about its name. Um, it was changed from Stalin Ali to Karl Marx Ali in 1960 to reflect a major reorientation that had occurred in Soviet politics after Stalin's death. In 1956, Khrushchev, the new premier of the Soviet Union, denounced Stalin and Stalinism. And in 1960, in East Berlin, incidentally just before the Berlin Wall came up, suddenly overnight the statues of Stalin were removed from the precinct of the boulevard and it was renamed Karl Marx Ali. Um, and suddenly East Germans woke up to a new reality, a new name um, and a new meaning appended to this strange, silent, heavy place in the heart of the city. And that name has remained um, until, this, until today, even though there was quite extensive debate after the wall fell about renaming Karl Marx Ali. And yet it has been kept for the same reason um, that Berlin was, the, was chosen to be the capital of reunited Germany, to remember and reflect upon the fact that for 40 years, East Berlin was a very different place, in a very different country, in a very different time. And this is what I love about Berlin, is these buildings that were built for these particular ideological um, moments are then left in the present without their meaning attached to them anymore. And we are left as observers and occupiers to wander around their remains in bemused fascination. I'd like to now turn to a discussion of the Berlin Wall and the effect that it had on the landscape of Berlin. Um, I'm not going to talk about the human cost of the wall. I'm specifically focusing on the effect Berlin had, the Berlin Wall had on the city itself. Um, the Berlin Wall was originally erected on the 13th of August 1961 by the East German authorities 
to solve a very practical problem, which was that there had been a consistent and massive ex exodus of refugees from East Germany to West Germany via Berlin. And this had been carrying on throughout the 1950s. But by the early 1960s, this flow of refugees had grown far larger. So the solution the East Germans came up with was to build a wall that entirely enclosed West Berlin. Because the minute an East German could get into West Berlin, which until 1961, when the wall comes up, was fairly easy. There was, as I've said before, plenty of traffic between the two sides of the city. But once an East German was in West Berlin, they could apply for West German citizenship and were then beyond the reach of the East German authorities. So essentially, West Berlin had become a kind of drain through which all of the refugees were uh, escaping to the West. And more importantly, a brain drain that was damaging the social fabric of East Germany. So as a result, this solution has come up with. It is a very awkward, brutal uh, compromise, but it works very well. Uh, within weeks and months of the wall coming up, the flow of refugees leaving East Germany dramatically reduces. And over the next 28 years, the East Germans perfect the wall so that it, it goes from being an original barrier of bricks and barbed wire to becoming an extraordinary complex a double walled system with guard towers, dog runs, fences, the, an enormous, sometimes I think of it in a way like a medieval fortress with modern technology. And this whole thing wrapped itself for 155 kilometers around West Berlin. And now we have to ask ourselves what compromises, what um, improvisation occurs when something like this is built in a city? There was no precedent for it. I mean, certainly Berlin had been divided until 1961, so that was not new. What was new was this immense and intimidating boundary line, this, this monstrosity of a wall that actually made the two sides of the city inaccessible to each other. And that's an entirely different arrangement from the 1950s. And now, uh, town planners and architects are required to come up with a way of managing a city where the sinews that Brian Ladd spoke about, that we've mentioned already, the sinews of the city um, are now not, the problem is now how to manage them cut in half. Train lines, railway lines, um, uh, so railway lines, underground, bus routes, tram routes, gas, water, electricity lines, hospitals, churches, schools, how to manage a city not just in half, but inaccessible, where the two sides are inaccessible to each other. And some very curious uh, experiments were come up with to try and manage this problem. The first of which we're going to look at now, which is the West Berlin uh, development known as the Kultur Forum. Kultur Forum, forgive my pronunciation, in English the Culture Forum. This is the place where my awareness of the emptiness of Berlin in the post-war period really came into being. Um, and it began with me not getting this place when I came here. And where we are is at the Kultur Forum. Um, and the Kultur Forum was an artificially created uh, re resuscitation uh, or to the lungs of the cultural life of West Berlin. Because once the wall came up in 1961, most of the important institutions from opera houses to theatres and libraries were in the eastern zone and when the wall came up traffic between the two sides was now over and so what they did they had here a huge area pressed right up against the berlin wall you can see the towers of potsdamer platz up ahead um, and pressed against the wall ran through potsdamer platz this area was relatively empty it was a central part of the city that had been damaged during world war ii um, and they saw this as a chance to develop not just a cultural hub for West Berlin, but to make a few points to the East Germans about the grotesqueness of their monumentalism that was happening on the other side of the Berlin Wall. And so they built here a range of buildings, um, museums, library, uh, philharmonie, all designed by top architects, including Hans Scharoun's Philharmonic over here, that yellow building sticking up there, I call it the submarine, uh, the state library, 
Later on, we'll show you Mies van der Rohe's new national gallery. Each of these buildings was uh, engendered to show the uniqueness, the energy, the creativity and the heterogeneity of life in capitalist West Berlin in opposition to the formalism and monumentalism of places like Karl Marx Ali in the East. When you read accounts of Berlin in the 60s, 70s, 80s, then my theory of emptiness is um, confirmed. People describe this place as being shabby and um, a strange empty zone. Um, Andy, the cameraman, describes seeing in the 90s, right? Scatterings of bizarre um, uh, sculptures just sort of left here, as if uh, in an afterthought, what to do with this strange empty place. Um, and to me, my, my poetic or artistic interpretation of this emptiness is precisely that it was constructed from scratch, contrived to rebuke the Berlin Wall, and in the end carried with it the sort of meaninglessness of that contrivedness. The story of the Kultur Forum is the story of uh, the necessary reinvention of Berlin once it had been so determinedly divided by the Berlin Wall. Um, and the story doesn't end with the Kultur Forum. All kinds of strange, as I said previously, strange compromises and improvisations had to be had uh, to try and maintain some semblance of functionality in this broken into city. So things arose um, such as the ghost stations. Um, the ghost stations came about because the overland and under, uh, underground train systems had to be separated. I mean, I'm very dramatically simplifying a complicated story, but we can simply say that the overland trains stayed, belonged to the East, East Berlin and the underground trains, the subways, belonged to West Berlin. But this posed a dramatic problem um, many of the subway lines ran under portions of East Berlin. And in order to prevent people from using these subway lines as a way to escape to the West, the East, German, East Germans often cemented up the entrances to the subways um, and created these ghost stations. And this to me is an extraordinary thing when they opened it up in, 1960, uh, in 1989 and 1990, when they opened up these ghost stations, they still found the detritus and the paraphernalia um, from the late 50s, early 1960s, film posters, etc. Um, and this uh, dereliction went very deeply into the heart of the city. For example, Potsdamer Platz was a ghost station. Now, Potsdamer Platz is the equivalent of Times Square in New York. That's the only example that I can give that's adequate as a comparison. And yet, for the years that the wall was up, the wall cut right through Potsdamer Platz and reduced the entire area around it to into a massive empty zone. And this is beautifully captured in the Wim Wenders film's Wings of Desire, where an old man wanders around um, Potsdamer Platz on the western side of the wall and just thinks, what's happened to this place? It's buzzing energy, it's movement, it's people. He asks the question, how can this be Potsdamer Platz? story points to one of the most important things about the Berlin Wall, that it led to a great deal of dereliction in the city. Wherever the wall ran, both in the east and the west, there was less development, uh, less reconstruction, and empty spaces grew up in the middle of the city, in places that would never normally be empty in the middle of a city. Um, and this is a point that various academics have raised, including Dirk Verheyen in his book Cold War Legacies in Contemporary Berlin. He makes the point that the city areas that ran along the wall and around the wall zone languished, languished both literally and figuratively. Um, other writers have referred to the deformation of the city. Um, and this, for me, is one of the most fascinating uh, aspects of the wall's legacy, is the emptiness it left behind when it fell. 
emptiness where in places in a city that would normally be extremely and highly developed were because of the Berlin Wall rendered into something like pasture land. So I think that this is one of the most um, fascinating aspects of the Berlin Wall which is that as it ran its 155 kilometer path around the edges of West Berlin, it created what one could call, what I call, a deadly emptiness, which has been filled since the Berlin Wall fell in a variety of very interesting ways. And what we're going to look at next is two monuments that speak to some of the most traumatic um, moments in the Berlin past, and that at the same time incorporate into their midst the emptiness left behind by the Berlin Wall. We're standing in front of the Topography of Terror, one of the two memorials I'm going to be showing you in this film. Um, and this is the site of the original headquarters of the Nazis' apparatus of terror, including the SS and the Gestapo. Their prison block, um, their administration building, from which the entire Holocaust was managed and conceived and carried out in terms of its administrative processing. And the point I wish to make today about this place is specifically the immense emptiness of it. introduced these two memorials with the idea that the space left behind by the Berlin Wall was embodied in the landscape of both memorials. To give you an indication of this, you can see there the remains, one of the longest remaining strips of the original Berlin Wall cutting along the street with, on the other side, the old Goering's Air Ministry rising up one of the major remaining Nazi buildings left extant in Berlin. And then, of course, behind me, the site of Acht Prinz Albrechtstrasse, which was the headquarters of the Gestapo. And this was Himmler's lair. This was the place where if you got a call and were invited to a meeting or, to, or called in to Acht Prinz Albrechtstrasse, you really knew you were in trouble. There was an in-house prison where brutal torture methods were carried out and most people went from here straight to concentration camps. Now, the landscape of the area um, is in the western side, or is on the western side of the Berlin Wall. And this area languished in the years after the Second World War, again essentially kept empty by the presence of the Berlin Wall. Um, and it was very hard to know what to do with this little plot of bloodstained earth. In the 1980s they excavated here and discovered on the western side the remains of the Gestapo prison block cells. There's something of course extraordinarily symbolically powerful about the cells being up against the Berlin Wall. And when the Berlin Wall fell, like so many areas around it throughout the 43 kilometers that ran through the inner city, this emptiness was there to be filled. And now the process began consultations, propositions as to how to memorialize something as extraordinarily brutal as the legacy of the Gestapo. And in the end, what won out was this concept. 1990, this was conceptualized, but it only opened in the 2000s. An empty, open space with a very unobtrusive square building where an exhibition marks the or describes the apparatus of terror. Uh, created by the Gestapo. Um, I'm not as interested in the museum though as I am in the space around it. As you'll see later on at the Holocaust Memorial, this is very expensive real estate now, in the heart of the city, and yet it remains empty, because emptiness was the only way to respond in the end to the horror of what this place represents, that it be excavated and left open like bones to the sky.
We're standing at the second memorial we're looking at in this lecture, which is the Holocaust Memorial in the center of Berlin. This is the official German memorial to the Holocaust. It was opened in 2005, designed by the American architect Peter Eisenmann. It consists of 2,711 block-like structures, sarcophagi or stelae, depending on how you interpret it, and it covers an entire block of the city. But what block of the city? It covers an area that was, between 1961 and 1989, a huge portion of the death strip right here in the center of Berlin. And we are literally in the heart of the old city. Behind me is the government quarter, Wilhelmstrasse, Pariser Platz, and the Brandenburg Gate are to my right. Um, and Potsdamer Platz is just up the road to my left. So we are literally in the heartbeat of the city. And really, for to an extraordinary degree, for a capital city or for any city, this area was a massive derelict zone throughout the period that the Berlin Wall was up. And in fact, this part was part of the death strip. So it was inaccessible to people from East and West Berlin and covered a 500 meter wide area. Now there is pathos in this place. Not only is this the memorial to the Holocaust, but it is only here because this part of the city was empty for 28 years when the war was up. And it is also right on the edge of Hitler's, the site of Hitler's Reichschancellery, uh, which was the place where Hitler committed suicide in his bunkers under the Reichschancellery in 1945. So literally a stone's throw from the memorial is the site of Hitler's death. And the theme of emptiness endures here because this was the center of the city, because the Reich's Chancellery was here, because the Soviets cleared the block up completely and took all the material from the Reich's Chancellery to rebuild Berlin and build other memorials. And because this then became a massive guarded zone, because the, the East Germans were worried, that the bunker complex, there might be portions of the bunker complex still enduring, which worried them for security reasons. And as such, here there was this exaggeratedly wide death strip. For all of these layers of a traumatic past, when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, there was the space to build this memorial here to the worst genocide in human history. Peter Eisenman designed this memorial, he referred to it as a place of no information. In other words, he leaves the uh, encounter entirely up to individuals as they come here to walk through the memorial and experience the undulating height, um, the stele rising up around them. Um, it is a physical experience rather than an intellectual experience. And this was about the only thing Eisenman would say about the meaning behind the memorial because he wished for it to be open to interpretation. But I would like to point out what for me is so profound about this place. We are standing in the heart of Berlin. This is extremely valuable property that I'm standing on right here. And it has been rendered eternally, we hope, until the sun explodes, eternally empty, undevelopable, unmonetizable, a place that holds a geometric heart of darkness in silence at the center of Berlin remembering something that should never ever be forgotten and the fact that the city cannot monetize this huge block of high-value real estate is to me another kind of profound memorial especially in the times we live in today with mass development of the city with the topography of terror and the Holocaust Memorial. 
how the deadly emptiness, as I call it, of the Berlin Wall was incorporated into the emptiness of these two significant memorials. Um, and most importantly for this lecture, that the monetary value of both plots of land were surrendered in order to create memorials and museums that were significant enough to address the scope, the scale, the challenge of facing this difficult German history. Um, and so both of these memorials use this space in this quite sacred way, I would argue. But on the other side of the equation, um, another kind of use has been made um, of the deadly emptiness left behind by the Berlin Wall. And this is also very important. Um, the Berlin Wall ran for 43 kilometers through central Berlin, um, through all the significant inner city neighborhoods. And where it ran, dereliction occurred on both sides of the wall. The wall, it was not one wall, but a two wall complex, which was on average 35 meters across. The death strip was on average 35 meters across. And this, what I called previously kind of medieval fortress with modern technology, left behind substantial corridors of open land in the city, which were greatly valued when the city was struggling with a huge debt after reunification. And large chunks of the Berlin Wall were sold, or of the old land upon which the Berlin Wall ran, was sold off to developers. And so you have throughout the city now, I mean, perhaps if you think about what would happen in a city like Paris or even London or New York, there was suddenly 43 kilometers of developable land running through the center of those cities. It is an extremely attractive um, situation for developers, especially in a city struggling financially after reunification. And so you had a massive explosion of developments that actually ran along the path of the old Berlin Wall, often built um, for maximum profit with very little attention paid to how they fitted in with the landscape around them in Berlin. Uh, so, for example, some of the apartments along Bernauerstrasse, um, just before the Bernauerstrasse memorial to the Berlin Wall, um, really are quite ugly and do not match anything around them. And now their um, expensiveness and their newness stands as testament to where the old wall ran. As we come to the end of this lecture, I'd like us to refer back to the question I raised at the beginning, that so many people comment on the strangeness and the emptiness of Berlin, even now today. Um, and I've tried to show some of the reasons for that. Um, the devastation of World War II, the curious and unique rebuilding of the two halves of the city along totally different ideological lines, and finally, the dereliction and deformation caused by the Berlin Wall. That dereliction contributed to a unique cultural moment a year in Berlin in the 1990s. Um, what am I referring to? When the Berlin Wall falls, thousands of young people from around the world swarm to Berlin um, to party on the site where the Cold War finally ended. And what they discover is whole neighborhoods um, around the Berlin Wall that are, as I've said, derelict. Uh, in Prenzlauer Berg, for example, an old East Berlin neighborhood, um, the buildings were still bu bullet riddled from the end of World War II. They hadn't, been they hadn't been renovated throughout the period of the GDR, the East German regime. Um, a lot of these uh, apartments were empty because for two reasons. One, East Germans in the 1980s had tended to move out to the edge of the city where the East German government had built um, huge modern housing estates. And then many East Germans had left. They had left East, uh, Berlin heading for the West either before or after the wall fell. So what young people discovered in the early 1990s was empty apartments, empty factories, empty shops, empty basements, and an entire world of squats, of collectives of galleries, of clubs, of bars, just literally mushroomed overnight in a city that soon became legendary for its cheap to non-existent rent. And now, of course, all of that has changed. Berlin has gentrified very dramatically in the last 20 years, especially in the last five years. So since I moved to the city in 2014, I've seen a huge change in the way this city works. 
mainly as a result of this international de these inter international developers that are rebuilding the city. But the myth of this party city where any kind of experimentation is possible still lingers in the air. Um, and the point I wish to make is for those who don't know where that myth comes from, where that reputation comes from, they, w they need to understand that this comes precisely from the peculiar and particular history of the city, from World War II to the Berlin Wall and beyond, that made it a place like no other in the world. I'm going to end by talking about the green spaces of Berlin and one particular green space. But it is important to note that Berlin is one of the greenest cities in the world. It is 43% parkland or green space. There, is literally, there are literally thousands of parks in the city. Um, one of the reasons for this is that Berlin lost its role as an, an industrial power after World War II. Um, the division of the city and Berlin being deep inside East Germany meant that industry moved to West Germany, West, German, West Berlin's industry moved to West Germany, and that meant that many factories and railway complexes went into, fell into dereliction. And often uh, green spaces grew up, green areas developed there. But there is also the way in which after the wall fell, the, part, the Berlin Wall led to a certain kind of greening of the city. And this is the final memorial, my personal, one of my personal favorites, that I'm going to tell you about now. And that is the story of Mauer Park in Prenzlauer Berg. The English translation of Mauer Park is Wall Park. Um, and it's named after um, the fact that between 1961 and 89, there was a substantial strip there, death strip of the Berlin Wall, falling between the eastern neighborhood, falling between and separating the eastern neighborhood of Prenzlauer Berg from the western neighborhood of Wedding. And when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, local people living around uh, the now defunct death strip there began to plant gardens and green the strip. And after a while, a kind of culture of its own took off in Mauer Park. And it was literally a community-based park that arose in the emptiness left behind by the Berlin Wall. And after much uh, negotiation between the, the town, between the, the Berlin uh, authorities and the local people living around there, that park became permanent. And it is now home to a very famous um, uh, weekly karaoke session and a flea market and it's recently been dramatically um, renovated. I think many people will miss the older rougher Mauer Park because this is the point about Mauer Park. It's not actually a very pretty park. Uh, there are many more beautiful parks around Berlin. Um, this park is grubby, at least it was until its very recent renovation. Um, and it stands as a testament to the interesting projects and experiments that ro arose up in the wake of the Berlin Wall falling, so that these, a zone like that could become a green zone, also a site of community, of the community working together, the community from both sides of the wall, communities from both sides of the wall. So instead of a grandiose summary of this lecture, I'm going to leave you now with this little story about Mauer Park and hope that in it you will see all of the themes that I've attempted to address in this lecture about the ways in which the cataclysmic 20th century history of Berlin marked the city in ways that make its landscape unique and that has re endured purposely at the hands of humans inadvertently so that even to this day in Berlin, it is really one of those places where you cannot ever forget what happened here. At the entrance to Mauer Park, from the Wedding, western side, people will encounter, after they've walked by a climbing wall and petting zoo for kiddies, a narrow corridor that follows exactly the path of the Berlin Wall death strip. Now that narrow strip meanders between gentrified East Berlin, its old Prenzlauer Berg tenements, 
beautifully refurbished for the now wealthy residents who rent or own them. And Vedding in the west, whose formerly ramshackle working class apartment blocks have been replaced by shining, grotesque, functional, too expensive new apartment blocks. After all, everybody wants a piece of Mauer Park these days. But in this narrow strip, something else exists. For here is a forest of birch trees, youngish, white-limbed, randomly scattered around. Birch trees are pioneer trees. They grow where there is space. They take root where they can. And so here is a small, almost insignificant, birch wood. But it is not insignificant that it is here. These trees grew in the suddenly empty space left behind by the death strip of the Berlin Wall. Whilst humans marked the line of the war elsewhere, with their memorials or their aggressive developments, at many places around Berlin it is the birch trees that have grown their own, possibly inadvertent memorial to the Berlin Wall. Marking the path that was once kept clear by concrete and guard towers and guns. <laughs>